Question 116 reads, what is or why is prayer necessary for Christians? Because it is the chief part of the thankfulness which God requires of us. And because God will give his grace and Holy Spirit to those only who with hearty sighing unceasingly beg them of him and thank him for them. And congregation, I just draw your attention to the answer here, particularly that issue, because it is the chief part of thankfulness. It's important for us to understand that phrase. In light of what? In, in light of the Ten Commandments? Prayer must take the priority, not the Ten Commandments. Not our good works. Not our traditions. Not our rituals or customs. Prayer is the chief part. It's not the only part. It includes the Ten Commandments. It includes good works. But prayer must take the greatest priority in your life, in the life of this church. If this church is going to survive, it must be grounded in prayer. If we're going to be deficient, and surely we are, in some aspect of theology, doctrine, or if we're going to be deficient in some aspect of our spiritual life, it can't be here. If you're going to be deficient in your spiritual walk with Jesus Christ, it can't be here. To say it rather coarsely, maybe we could say it this way. There is no griping before the Lord God. There's no crying of tears and whining about life and how hard it is. If you neglect prayer in your life. Personally, maybe I should say it this way. I can't go before the Lord God and pray or I can't go before the Lord God and complain. Complain about this and complain about that and complain about this when my knees do not show the wear of prayer. Every sermon, every study, every, everything needs to be saturated with prayer. That's what the catechism is saying here. If you're going to be deficient in your family devotions, it can't be here in prayer. Question 117 reads, What belongs to such prayer as God is pleased with and will hear? First, that from the heart we call upon the one true God only who has revealed himself in his word. For all he has commanded to us or us to ask of him. Second, that we might thoroughly know our need and misery in order to humble ourselves before the face of his majesty. Third, that we be firmly assured that Notwithstanding, we are unworthy of it. He will, for the sake of Christ our Lord, certainly hear our prayer, as he has promised us in his word. And question 118. Why has God commanded us 
to ask of him. Or what has God asked? All things necessary for soul and body, which Christ our Lord has comprised in the prayer he himself has taught us. Well, congregation, let's now open up the Holy Scriptures to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. One of the best places to start to understand prayer is to go into the scriptures, to look at the scriptures with regard to uh, the prayers that are offered up by the saints. To look at our Lord's Prayer in John 17, which hopefully, Lord willing, in the near future we will do. One of the best ways to understand prayer is to go into the Word of God in the book of Psalms. Pray the way the prophets prayed. Pray the way in which King David prayed. We look at one prayer today, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's prayer, as is given to us in verses 3 through 19 of Daniel chapter 9. Trying to gather some nuggets from this great prophet, the prophet of Daniel. So Daniel chapter 9 I'll just read verses 1 through 19. Here is the reading of God's Word. In the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princesses, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings and princesses and our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. 
For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquity of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord spoke, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God. For your city and your people are called by your name. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. O congregation, today we enter into the issue of prayer by studying the petitions of the Lord's Prayer, often called, really, the Apostles' Prayer. It is a natural progression to move the exposition, or from the exposition of the Ten Commandments, to the vital truths about prayer. The Ten Commandments alone remind us that we are to pray, because we fall under conviction of the Ten Commandments and our disobedience and own rebellion in our own heart. But also because that's the standard by which God uses. That's the rule by which God uses. So that we would live a life that's pleasing to him. We are a needy people. You see, prayer is the result of knowing our sin. It's the result of really understanding our needs. Prayer is really the result of knowing our sin and the forgiveness of that sin through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer reminds us that we are not married to the law but to Christ, who is the substance of the law, and who, by his Spirit, leads us to a life of holiness. Prayer is the greatest expression of thankfulness. Grind that truth into your heart. Don't let the devil steal that out of your heart. Don't let any minister teach otherwise. Prayer is the greatest expression of thankfulness because, as the Catechism reminds us, God gives us his grace and Holy Spirit 
only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly. and thanking him for them. We see this truth in all the prayers of Scripture, in all those special times when the prophets prayed in the Psalms, and especially in our Lord, who made it a priority always to pray. And to teach his disciples how to pray. We see this truth in all the prayers of Scripture. Especially here in Daniel chapter 9. The background of Daniel chapter 9 is important. Daniel has been in Babylon in a pagan land for most of his life. Daniel has greatly depended on prayer as he often prayed three times a day. In chapter 9, Daniel reveals his heart even all the more to believe in God's word and to have the hope in accordance with God's promise and the prophecy of Jeremiah. Even in the midst of such sadness, deep sadness, deep alienation, Deep loneliness. Daniel goes to prayer. Grounded upon the word of God. The word of promise. You remember God revealed to Jeremiah that the captivity would last for 70 years. That Israel would be released from their captivity because of their rebellion. Because of their hatred towards God. Because of the breaking of the covenant. God had disciplined them. Brought them into Babylon. That is the southern kingdom. And now God in his mercy and his righteousness and his forgiveness had promised that it would release them in 70 years. Daniel was asking himself, was this time coming to an end? Maybe in all of his calculations of how long he had been there, maybe he was a year shy or maybe a year more, maybe 10 years shy of those 70 years. He, was, he didn't know for sure. But he knew one thing. He knew that God had promised and that God was no liar but a fulfiller of all of his promises. And so Daniel was asking himself, was it coming to an end? There is hope. There is comfort in the word of God. There is hope because by means of prayer God excites our hearts to rest upon his promises of scripture. And so with the rise of Darius in verse 1, Daniel responds in prayer to his insight from God's word in verse 2. But that response was a heart-driven petition seeking mercy from God. He didn't go to the local psychiatrist he didn't seek out the local minister or rabbi. He didn't seek the king. He sought God. In a heart-driven petition to seek mercy from God. It is from this chapter 9 that we gain some insights on the essentials of prayer. What are the essentials of prayer? How can we structure our prayer life so that it stays true and lively? How do we get away from the adage when the minister asks, how is your prayer life? And normally we answer this way, it could be better. And usually when a person says that, the minister says, that means they're not praying. Everything could be better. I remember when I asked somebody, I would ask people, as a police officer, I would ask somebody who was, has smelled of alcohol, how many beers have you had? And he'd say, I've had a couple. 
you knew right away that person drank probably eight to ten beers, maybe six. But he didn't have two. That's a signpost. And it's the same thing in our own life with regard to prayer. When someone says, well, it could be better, usually that means they're not praying at all, or very rarely. As we look forward to the exposition of the Lord's Prayer, let us today center upon the essentials of prayer. Through the acronym of ACTS, A-C-T-S. Maybe what we really need is maybe some structure to our prayers. And clearly the Lord gives us structure. But the whole idea of prayer itself, how can we structure it so that these elements really become a reality of our hearts? So that we could look at prayer as a wonderful time of communion with God, with communication with God. How can we pick it up? Maybe if we use this acronym when we pray, it would help us out. My suggestion is that you pray in, with these parameters as you go through the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. A-C-T-S. First, adoration. Second, confession. Third, thanksgiving. Fourth, supplication. Acts. A-C-T-S. Well, let's look at each of these essential elements of prayer. The first element of a biblical-based, Christ-centered prayer is adoration. By adoration, we mean to venerate in true devotion. Adoration comes from the Latin word for adorato, which means homage. It shows deepest respect towards God, a reverence, strong admiration or devotion. That's what adoration is. We notice adoration in Daniel's prayer and the words of verse 4. O Lord, the great and awesome God. Do you see the reverence in Daniel's words? Yahweh, eternal God that you are, covenant God, the great an awesome God. Notice how Daniel appeals to God based on his attributes of greatness and awesomeness. And those words of verse 4. God's attributes of righteousness and justice flow throughout Daniel's prayer. Verse 7, verse 14, verse 16. And with regard to God's mercy and forgiveness, verse 9. Adoration. Congregation then centers upon God and all of his attributes as they are given to us and displayed before us in Jesus Christ. The words of 1 Corinthians 1.30. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. God's attributes help us to pray correctly, to get our minds set right, because the heart normally in Scripture always follows the mind. Set your mind on things above where Christ Jesus is. You see, as with Daniel, when you pray, meditate upon God's justice. Meditate on his mercy, his graciousness, his righteousness, and his holiness. By learning the attributes of God, you can adore, reverence, and praise God for who he really is. Over against 
the false ideas of God that constantly pound upon us through the media. In so many sermons. The world often plays, displays to us a pantheistic God. Worse yet, a panentheistic God. That's the God of the liberals. Or maybe the God of Arminianism with him being frustrated in heaven because he can't save everyone without exception. You see, adoration is about worshiping God for who he really is. And who he really is is in accordance with Scripture. Not apart from Scripture, but according to Scripture. And Daniel shows us that here, just as our Lord did in John 17 as well. Well, the second attribute or second essential element of prayer, the second essential of Christ-centered prayer is confession. True confession is married, intimately married to both faith and repentance. Confession then includes our sin so that we can have restored fellowship with God. Confession is the result of the Holy Spirit in His convicting ministry to teach us our need for the, Christ of, for the cross of Christ in our reconciliation to God. We notice confession of sin with Daniel's words. Fasting in sackcloth and ashes in verse 3. And in verse 4, as he makes confession about sin in verses 5 and 6. He says there, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, <clears throat> the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princesses, to our fathers and all the people of the land. Do you see confession here? Do you see it displayed publicly in sackcloth and ashes? The humility? There's no arrogance. There's no pompousness. With Daniel and his prayer of confession? He confesses that the nation, which includes himself, he says, we have rebelled against God's word. Not merely the oral traditions that were developing at the time, but against God's word. Daniel could only fall before God to confess in verse 15, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. Notice how Daniel takes personal ownership of his own sin as well as corporate sin. This is Daniel. This is righteous Daniel. This is the one who prayed three times a day. And look at his humility. Hear his humility with regard to his own personal ownership as well is corporate sin as well. He does not seek to distance himself from his own personal ownership, nor does he seek to distance himself from the nation. Confession is about me. 
It's about us. It's not about you and them. We need to learn that truth. As we see from the example of Daniel and others in the Bible, confession of sin is specific and transparent. You're not going to hide anything from God. Be specific in your prayers. Be transparent. Remember David's words in Psalm 51, verses 3 through 4. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. That's ownership. David is not ignorant of his consequences of sin. But he knows that the primary offense is made against God himself. Because sin breaks fellowship with God, we must then be honest, clear, and transparent in our confessions of sin. When you pray, are you specific about that? Are you specific? You may say... Why do I need to confess my sin to God since I am justified by faith in Christ? And you barrel your chest out and say, don't tell me about my sin. I've been washed in the blood of Christ. I need not worry. Well, confession reminds us in a very important way to lament our sin. To be broken with regard to our sin. Confession reminds us that we're not there yet, and that we're still under construction. You're not perfect. Confession reminds us to seek renewal through the Holy Spirit with God. You see, without confession, without renewal of fellowship with God, then we would dry up, as David said in Psalm 32, 3. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. David didn't barrel his chest out and say, I'm justified by faith. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. Now he knew his sin. And he knew that if he kept silent about that sin and neglected confession before the Lord God, that his spiritual life would dry up. And that's what's happening with some of us when we neglect prayer in our lives. When prayer doesn't take primary in our life, we begin to dry up and start blaming everybody. The reason why I'm dried up in my soul is because of the minister. I just don't connect with him. The reason why I'm drying up in my soul is because I need a better church. The reason why I'm dried up in my marriage is because, well, because of her, because of him. When prayer has been neglected, family prayer, Individual prayer has been neglected. You're going to dry up. Like the publican, we do pray and confess, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The believer finds himself in Christ and enjoys full well the fruits of God's mercy. In Titus 3, verse 5, we're reminded, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Renewal. Renewal. We need renewal. And that begins with prayer. We need to be careful, though, at this point, to watch out for the pendulum swing. You know where the pendulum swing is. It's just a fact of life. I was talking with Jonathan about the pendulum swing in all of our lives. 
That's a terrible thing to have a pendulum swing. You see, some Christians are very lax and just go on their merry way, never thinking of sin, while others fixate on their failings and suffer from despair. Oh, that's a pendulum swing. One person feels no conviction of sin. They've been washed with Christ. They've been washed under the blood. No conviction at all. Straight ahead. And the other person feels no relief from the sin. There's your pendulum swing. Neither of these habits should mark the Christian. The Christian should often feel conviction and confess and be cleansed by resting upon the Lord. What sins have you brought before the Lord? Confess them and then raise up in the newness of Christ. And just as God has casted them in the deepest part of the sea, so shall you. How dare you keep on your sins when God has forgiven you? The pendulum string. Stay away from it. It's ugly. See, the daily cleansing is, is like the expunging of a guilty record before the judge. For the believer in Christ that's already been accomplished on the cross. He's already had his guilt wiped away through the Christ's atoning work. This daily cleansing is more like the, the scraping of barnacles off the hull of a ship so we can move a bit more freely. Confession, daily confession, in our prayers brings renewal and assurance of Christ's love and salvation, which rests upon Jesus Christ alone. See, confession and prayer reminds us of the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ. Let us find comfort in those words of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever noticed that after you pray, that there's a sense of, there's a skip in your life? There's a skip in your heart? Confess your sins before the Lord and rest upon Jesus Christ and his renewal. A third, the third essential element of prayer is thanksgiving. The Hebrew word is translated uh, to throw out the hands. The extending of the empty, empty hands to God means that we have nothing to give. You see, we're only receptors, not initiators of God's grace. We only receive what God gives and we receive that in thankful praise. You see, this is why, I don't know if you've ever made this connection, this is why in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, we read, I desire, Paul says, I desire then he says this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These are the words, not of Paul, but of Christ. I desire that in every place men should pray, comma, lifting holy hands. That's not a Pentecostal thing. That's a biblical thing. To raise up empty hands of thankfulness before the Lord God is essential in prayer and it's essential in the life of the believer. There are times when I pray alone. I pray, when I pray I lift my hands up towards heaven. There's times when I pray when I'm flat on the ground. There's times when I'm praying on my knees. There's times when I'm flat on my back. You see, posture 
is important in prayer too. May I suggest laying down in bed after a hard day of work just before you fall asleep is not the best time to pray. Because before you know it, it'll be morning and you were, fell asleep in your prayer. That's why we have kneelers in churches. Because posture is important. Daniel gives thanks to God in verse 4. O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy. Not only has to do with adoration, but it has also, he's thankful. He's thankful that God is great. He's thankful that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, the covenant-keeping God, the God who keeps his promises, is his God and the nation's God. In verses 2 through 6 and 12, Daniel expresses thankfulness that God supplied his word of judgment and hope by the prophets. Daniel is thankful that as God was merciful in the past, verse 15, so there is hope the Lord God will be merciful in the future. Actually, Daniel's emphasis throughout the prayer is thankfulness for God's cleansing and purifying judgment. Get that. Thank you, O Lord God, for bringing us here in Babylon. Because you've brought renewal to your people's hearts. I wonder when the last time you prayed, thank you, Lord, for the testings that you've brought into my life. Because they've driven me to prayer. They've driven me to adore you and to confess my need for you. In the midst of judgment, in the midst of testing, there is Daniel setting the example for you and for me. And we ought to see Jesus here. That as he goes to the cross, prayer is still a priority. So much so that he could say, not my will be done, but thine. It's here that we ought to be thankful for the judgment poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross. That God in his wisdom and righteousness laid on Jesus our sins to satisfy his justice and open up the gates of heaven for his people to enter in clothed in our Lord's righteous garments. Did you notice how Daniel prays not by our righteousness? No, we have nothing. We have nothing but empty hands. We are also taught to be thankful in our prayers. We ought to express thankfulness for God's testing of our faith. As well as the blessings that come from those testing, those hard times, those times of tribulation. I'm always mindful of Paul's words in Acts 14, verse 22. We must go through much tribulation before we enter the kingdom of God. That's true of every one of us. And that's true of this church. See, prosperity theology is unbiblical. You see, prosperity theology is blasphemy. You see, prosperity theology is wrong. God doesn't just simply want us to be healthy and wealthy. It contradicts every portion of Holy Scripture. To be thanks... To be filled with thankfulness is to be filled with God's grace and his joy. That comes from that word Eucharisto or the Eucharist, which means thanks. When Jesus' prayer, as he gave thanks at the last Passover and the first Lord's Supper, Jesus was offering prayer of thanksgiving for his separation that was about to come and his brokenness upon the cross. You see, Jesus was thankful that he was going to the cross to shed his blood. Because in the shedding of his blood, as confirmed in his resurrection, his people would go to heaven to be with him. 
It was through the cross, through his thankfulness in the cross, his displayed in the cross, his joy in the cross, that we are brought and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You see, what Jesus is teaching us even at the Lord's table and pictured throughout his whole life is that thankfulness unleashes God's grace, which allows us to experience joy even in the midst of brokenness and abandonment. As our Lord faced the humiliation of the cross, he, was, he experienced supreme joy, as the book of Hebrews reminds us. And this ought to be for us as well, congregation. When those hard times come, be all the more thankful as you identify with the Lord and his sufferings. So then thanksgiving is about whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks, Eucharisto, giving thanks, full of joy, full of empty-handedness to God the Father by him. Prayer is about being thankful for God has blessed us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then finally, talking about the essentials of prayer, there must be supplication. Supplication is a rare word in our days. You use that term outside, people are going to think you're crazy. But it is a biblically grounded word. In either the Old Testament and New Testament, the word supplication means request or petition for God's generosity, for his graciousness, for his mercy. While supplication centers upon personal needs, it also includes intercession for others as well. The emphasis is on spiritual passion. Supplication is about passion. It's about hunger and heartfelt desire. Again, we see this in Daniel as he prays for his needs and the needs of the nation. Notice the words in verse 3. Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Daniel was making a special, personal appeal to the Lord God seeking his favor. Daniel did not rush into God's presence on this occasion. He was in sackcloth and ashes. Instead, he spent time preparing for his prayer with God. For example, the fact that Daniel was involved in fasting indicates that he had been preparing himself both spiritually and physically before coming to the Lord. Daniel's prayer is filled with personal appeals for God's graciousness, mercy, and especially in verses 18 and 19 where we read these words. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations. And the city which is called by your name, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God. For your city and your people are called by your name. Do you, do you sense the vigor? Do you sense the intensity? Boy, that guy's intense. He must be nuts. Oh, that's part of prayer. And these words of Daniel remind us that our ability to go before God in prayer is not based on any self-righteousness, but only based upon Christ's righteousness the throne of judgment that we deserve has become a throne of grace on account of our Lord's merits and atoning sacrifice. So go. Go before God. Go. 
The doors are open. The, the curtain of the temple has been torn. It's open. Go in the name of Christ and supplicate before your God. You see, prayer is always to our Heavenly Father in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is our intercessor, our advocate, our high priest who brings us to bring our request to God on the wings of the Holy Spirit. So let's go. What's holding you back? What's holding you back? What's holding you back to having family worship? What's holding you back personally? Christ invites his people to come before the Heavenly Father as adopted children. James puts it practically by saying the reason why you don't get it is because you don't ask. Ask. So let us go before God, our Heavenly Father, with our tears and our petition for he cares for us. Stop going to the psychiatrist. Stop running to the minister so quickly. Stop running to the elders or your best friend. Stop running to Mary. Stop running to Pope Francis. Stop running to everybody, but go before your heavenly Father in the faith of Jesus Christ power of the Spirit of God. Let us never go doubting, as Hebrew 4 reminds us, but filled with faith, like Daniel, because God does incline his graciousness and merciful ear to us in Christ. Do you believe that? If you do, then you will. Congregation, as we learn to pray, to our Heavenly Father, in the name of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, through the petitions of our Lord's Prayer. Let us be reminded of those words in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what's the result of that? Verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Pray. Be a praying church. Pray. Be a praying family. Be a praying individual. Because it is the chiefest expression of gratitude. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we admit to you that all too often we're anxious. And the reason why we are so anxious is because our prayer life is not what it should be. We haven't brought our supplications before you with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for the tests. Thank you, Lord, for the judgments. Thank you, Lord, for those frowning providences that I don't understand. And yet, Lord, I am thankful for them. Because in them, I will become more mature. And I will identify with Christ's sufferings. Paul reminds us of that in this Philippians verse. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. The result of that is peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. And through that, you guard our hearts. You keep them focused on Jesus. Lord, Heavenly Father, have mercy upon us. Hear our prayers, Lord. Help us to be a praying church. Help our families to be praying families. 
Help us as individuals, whether we be single or married, to be filled with prayer. And then we will have that surpassing understanding. And you will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.